Hey everyone, welcome to my next video. In this one, I'm gonna talk to you about the ADC, the analog to digital converter. It's a very important peripheral inside your microcontroller because it lets you interface with the outside world, read the data and get it into your code, manipulate it, maybe send it as a measurement, maybe get a control from a potentiometer. It's very useful and it's probably one of the first thing you did with an Arduino is just getting the potentiometer value into your code. And this is the second most important peripheral to start working with after the, you mastered and talked about the GPIO. So it lets you get a whole nother control of the outside world. But in order for the ADC or your code to get the value of the outside voltage, it has to be converted from a many infinitely many steps in the analog domain to a finite number of steps in the digital domain at a finite amount of steps. So to do that, we firstly have to discuss how the ADC works. But before that, if you're here just for the code and the hardware initialization for the how, please go to one of the timestamps that are been on the screen right now. But if you want to learn how actually everything works and have a little bit of a guideline to how to approach the settings of your microcontroller so you can have the ADC measurements that you need, stick around and I'm gonna show you. So the first thing that we have to do is to sample the input signal. So because you have an infinitely many steps in time, because in between two time periods you can always find a finer one you have to sample the ADC at some kind of rate. And while you sample a small sample in that period of time, ADC has to convert that sample into a digital value. And it cannot do that infinitely fast. So that's why you need to hold a certain sample for a certain number of time so the ADC can convert it into a data. So over here I have this URL and it's a sample and hold. And this is the simplify schematic. So your input signal is over here and the output going to your ADC is over here. And this is inside the ADC. So basically you take an input signal, the analog signal, and you control when it is connected to the input of your ADC. So in this case, we connect the input signal and here's a small capacitor that gets charged to the same voltage as the input. Then the input gets disconnected, so this capacitor in theory holds this data, this charge, at a constant rate. Which it doesn't, it bleeds, uh, bleeds out, but it happens so fast that it's almost constant. And in this meantime, the ADC can do the conversion, which takes some number of steps and some time. And when it's done, it can connect another sample over here and it charges to a different voltage. So it has to do this called sample and hold. And then this period of time is dictated by the type of ADC because there are many types of ADC. And the type of ADC inside these many microcontrollers is called an SAR, called a successive approximation register. So the name gives it out. This ADC successfully tries to approximate the input voltage by comparing it to a reference voltage. And here's a lovely diagram of that. We have an input voltage and it goes into a sample and hold and then it gets compared in the comparator with a bit deck. So here's another deck, in this case can be any number of bits and what it does, let's say it's zero volts and it has one volt over here and the high of the comparator because the plus is larger than the minus goes into this logic and this logic determines to increase the voltage of this reference and it increases and when this voltage of the reference uh, oversees the input voltage, it goes low. So it has to uh, uh, oscillate around the main voltages coming in. And when the difference is small, then the output value is determined. So we have a graph over here of the constant input voltage that is controlled by the sample and hold circuit. And then the reference voltage goes around and around and around until there's no more distinguishable difference. And the voltage that is applied, so it's similar to the input voltage, is the voltage of this DAC. And the configuration of this DAC, or the binary representation of the voltage that the DAC is giving out, 
is actually the same as the binary representation of the input voltage of the analog input. So basically when SARDEX measure the input voltage, they actually measure uh, or actually they read the configuration, voltage configuration of the DAC that tries to approximate the voltage to the input voltage. So this way these DACs are quite fast. This uh, approximation routine is uh, adapting also in this new circuit, so it's not fixed step but it can, if you see this, it's very far away from it, it can increase the step size and stuff like that. There are all sorts of things and are very popular because they are quite fast, they're quite affordable, they have a reasonable amount of resolution and everything works. And yes, the next thing that we have to talk about is resolution. So we tackled sampling, we have to tackle resolution. So resolution is in theory the smallest difference of the input voltage that can be detected by the ADC. So here I have a small graph that has this quantization it's called. So you have to quantify the input voltage. Let's say that the input voltage on the x-axis over here goes from zero to the maximum. And this input voltage always gets compared to the certain reference voltage. In this case it's the DAC over here that gets fed a reference voltage. So this reference voltage is the maximum that the DAC can detect. And this y-axis is the digital representation of the output voltage in the binary. So the number of discrete steps over here and the size of the smallest step divided by the... Uh, actually the smallest step in the input voltage divided by the smallest step, it's called the resolution. So let's say in here we have to the power of 3 or 8 bits um, uh, different. So we have 8 different steps for let's say 1 volt, if the reference voltage is 1 volt. So the resolution is 1 over 8 of a volt. So this is over here our different stages. So our input voltage can only be one of this. So it's that's the principle of quantization. And the more resolution you have, the smaller and the finer the voltage step can be so your ADC can distinguish different voltages. In our case we have a 12 bit and this is very useful because Arduinos normally have 10 bits and 12 bit is uh, four times the resolution. So instead of 0 to 1023 you have to remember that the maximum value is the 2 to the power of resolution minus 1 because the 0 is also included as a measurement. And uh, to the power of 12 is 4096, so it goes from 0 to 4095. So we have four times as many steps for the same reference voltage. And that's very fine. And the next thing, because of different uh, resolutions, we have sigma delta ADCs. This is another type of the ADC, it works differently. So it actually works by oversampling the input signal and creating a frequency, uh, different pulses and you have to determine the width of those pulses and that with the long of more theory gets you the analog voltage uh, described in digital as you can see here you can uh, on this uh, analog devices page you can control by different steps and you can see the output voltage and the main thing is, is over here that if you start with small steps the mean output is very uh, wrong, it's wrong, it's 1 volt input but we're reading as 2.5 volts but if you go on and on and on this value changes and more loops it's finer, more loops it's finer so in essence sigma delta have to oversample very much so it has to take multiple samples so its output voltage can be determined that's why they're not very fast as SAR DAX are much faster and if you want even more faster, there are other ADCs. But the best thing about Sigma Deltas is that they are very high resolution because of this mode. They, uh, they heavily filter the lower frequency interference. That's why there can be high resolution. But they cannot go very fast. If you want to go very fast, you have to go something like a flash ADC that basically has a resistor divider ladder that divides a reference voltage into discrete steps and then has 2 to the power of n comparators that compare the input signal to this ladder. So the smallest one 
has the smallest reference voltage and the highest one has basically the reference voltage. And if the V in, let's say it's a half of V ref, the bottom half of these comparators are gonna signal the output high. And this is, as you can see, very wasteful because you have to have 2 to the power of M these comparators and these resistors which do drift and you have to make them very uh, stable. And, but these are very fast because when the input voltage comes, the output sets instantly. So these are for multi gigahertz and um, probably more uh, special intercases for different ADCs. But uh, we don't usually see this in the consumer and the prosumer electronics, mostly sigma deltas and SARS. And now that we cover this, let's go to our STM32 reference manual, which you should always have. And this actually describes everything you need to know about the ADC. I'm not gonna, gonna talk about everything. As you can see, this uh, section is very large and has lots of different settings for every type of scenario you possibly can figure out. But today I just want to point you to the simple things and the core ideas of the ADC that you can read in yourself so you can configure ADC for whatever purpose you need. So the first thing is, is you can see that the, freak, uh, the resolution can be changed because the resolution can be changed, the number of steps that you can take between can be faster. So uh, we're going to see in the next bit that the uh, cycle times, the more cycles that it takes for a larger, freak, uh, larger uh, resolution. Yes. And then different types of uh, operations discussed by here. And I want to discuss especially the functional diagram. And this is very important. So ADC in and of itself is this portion over here, but this isn't very useful because you have to control it. That's why we have the whole block over here as an ADC peripheral. So it includes multiple parts and the first part that's important is the clock because without clock nothing happens. So here we have clock coming from a prescaler. This is basically a divider that divides the input frequency that usually comes from the main system clock down even further because the ADCs uh, might not run as fast as the processor might run. So you can change with the prescaler the frequency of the ADC. Today we're not going to be focused so much on the frequency of operation because we just want to have a few values and we're not concerned with sampling really high sample rate data. We're just assuming that our data is constant DC voltage or very slow changing DC voltage. So everything that I talk about today applies. So the next part is that the ADC actually has two channels. It has injected channels and regular channels. Basically boils down to the regular channels, the one that you're gonna probably use most of the time. And it has a 16 of those that can be inputted into the settings at the same time. So the 16 channels can be read one by one or just one of them. Injected channels on the other hand can only have the capacity of four, but have a higher priority of conversion than the regular channel. So if you're having a regular channel conversion and there's some sort of interrupt or some kind of signal that you need to read from the ADC injected channels, these are gonna, the ADC is gonna start sample this instead of this and then it's gonna return to this one. So which pins is gonna convert what we have on the left over here. On the left we have all of the inputs for the ADC. Here we can have an analog multiplexer which is basically an analog switch that upon its setting can let through different signals. Over here we have GPIO signals and every ADC accepts 16 GPIO inputs, so from different 16 different uh, physical pins, and then it has three separate internal pin configurations. So the temperature sensor, yes, there is a temperature sensor inside your microcontroller, which is a good for rough estimation of the temperature of the microprocessor if it's not overheating and anything like that. Then we have the VREF, which is connected to the reference voltage inside the ADC, which is separate, and the VBAT, which is one of the supply pins of your microcontroller. And we're gonna have to look at that in the schematic in the next. So all these pins can be selected to go into the regular channel or the injectant channel conversion. As I said before, the ADC can go from zero or the negative definition of the, of the maximum swing to the maximum of the positive swing, and this is determined by the VREF. By default, the VREF is connected to the negative supply, 
and VREF is connected to the voltage which is the maximum voltage that the ADC is gonna read to. So if the VREF is 3 volt, the maximum voltage that the ADC can read is 3 volts. If it's 2 volts, it's 2 volts. And this is very useful if you only have channels that are up to a certain voltage. You can lower this VREF so the ADC has more resolution on the part of the voltage that you need. So if you're reading only maximum of 1 volt signals, it's a waste having a VREF of 3 volts because you have 2 volts left over and the resolution in the 1, point, 1 volt region is very small. But if you lower the VREF to 1 volt, then the resolution to 1 volt is 3 times as great as up to 3 volts. So this is a very useful thing to keep in mind and we're gonna see in the schematic how this works. Also, we have a separate supply, the analog supply, for the ADC itself, so the supply for it can be separate from the rest of the microcontroller. It's probably going to be the same 3.3 volts, but it can have much more uh, uh, filtering and stuff like that, so it, the supply is as quiet as possible, so you can have as little interferences or measurement as possibly. Then, on the bottom over here, we have the interrupts. So these are the type of uh, signals that can start in uh, conversion of the regular or injected channels. That's why you have two halves. You have one multiplexer for the injected channels and one for the regular channels. And the inputs, as you can see, come from different timers and different outputs of the timers. So example, timer one, channel one, two, three, and channel two from the timer two and so on. Also, on the, each of the multiplexer comes an external interrupt, so this comes from an external pin. So let's say you want to start an ADC conversion when a pin goes high. So you can route this over here through the multiplexer, you enable this bit and it goes to the regular channel. So it converts every time it gets an external interrupt, so kinda have automated conversion. And all that data has to go somewhere, it goes to the data register. For the regular conversion, you have only one 16-bit data register for a 12-bit data. So the data is going to go from the 0-bit to the 12-bit. For the injected data register, you have four 16-bit. So for every maximum number of conversion, you have its own data register uh, section. And apart from that, you have additional watchdogs and interrupt functionality. So the ADC can, uh, can be triggered or trigger an interrupt. So let's say if it's end of conversion, you want to trigger something to happen. So let's say if you complete a conversion, you want an LED to light up. So you can trigger an interrupt. So your code goes into the special function that triggers the LED, for example. And watchdog is similar, but it can run independently. So let's say you want to uh, have CPU on the sleep while ADC works, and then you want to start the a CPU up if the voltage on one of its pins exceeds or goes below a certain threshold value, which can be applied to the analog watchdog. It can create a certain uh, uh, interrupt and, I don't know, wake up the CPU or start a separate routine. So this is like a separate uh, timer uh, thing that can control different parts of peripheral. It's a type of uh, trigger, you could call it like that. So by that we went through the entire uh, configuration over here. So another very important thing is DMA, which is this little thing over here, so you wouldn't think it's very important, but it's quite. So DMA, as I talked in the previous videos, is standard library. The DMA is basically direct management access, memory access, and it's basically a peripheral that independently of the CPU can move data around the microcontroller's memory. So in this case it would be useful when the conversion of the ADC is completed, the it can trigger the DMA, sending a DMA request, and the DMA will go into the data register over here, read the data and just copy directly into some kind of a variable, or maybe directly into the SPI output register, so it can send out to the SPI. So it's basically really fine if you want to automate some kind of measurement. So if you have, let's say, an external interrupt, when it happens, it automatically starts the ADC. When it converts, it's called the, ADC, uh, the DMA. DMA copies data and goes into some kind of a variable. So the CPU didn't have to do anything and the data has been automatically uh, processed and stored into memory, which is really great for automated uh, reading of data. 
Then we have a few other more things. So we have a few settings of how the ADC works and we can go down. The one we're going to be focusing on today mostly is the single conversion mode. So this means that we have uh, ADC that we have to manually start or some interrupt manually starts the ADC. It performs a conversion, turns a flag called end of conversion flag high, and then we have to take the data. And then until we manually start the conversion again, the ADC is going to idle. So contrary to that, there's a continuous conversion mode. The continuous conversion mode is going to keep on converting data. So when it converts the data and starts over, it starts converting again. It's just going to continuously convert, which can be useful if you just want to continuously convert a certain variables. And you can uh, use this alongside the uh, scan mode, which is down here. And the scan mode basically enables the ADC to scan through all the input channels that we saw before. So if I have an image over here of the blog that we saw before. So let's say you have four pins on the input for the input, then uh, the, the regular channel will convert one after the other and we will see this later in the hall. So if we enable scan mode, the ADC after completing conversion of uh, any channel, it will iterate to another channel. So you don't have to manually change the selection of the channel. And there's loads of other things and other types of uh, control. Here's the data management using DMA. Multi ADC, I haven't ever really used that. But another one is the temperature sensor that I mentioned before. Yes, here are all the uh, settings that you can use. So reading the temperature, you have to convert it with this uh, equation. And you have these parameters like uh, V25 and stuff like that stored in the, the data sheet for this processor family. Basically, this temperature sensor isn't really used for measuring like ambient temperature because it has very poor precision, but it's enough for measuring the localized temperature of the processor to know if it's overheating or the, uh, anything around the MCU is overheating, which is very, uh, very handy. And then basically we have interrupts and registers. So now we're in HAL, so we're not so confirmed with registers. So let's go to our HAL library and let's start working. So what I have here is a sample project. It's just the clock input and debug lines. That's it. That's all there is. So let's say we want to start measuring ADC. Well, we can just click on any pin and let's see if it has ADC functionality. No. Oh, this is an external interrupt. Nice. Here. No. Here. Yes. As we can see, this pin has three separate ADCs on input zero. But before we do that, we have to remember that this processor, in my case, is on the STM32 F4 discovery board. The pin has to be able to convert the ADC data because we have any pull up or pull down resistors, the value on the ADC input will be always forced. So we have to make sure that this pin is not connected to anything else. For that, we can go to the schematic for this board. As you can see, this is the page for the processor. And usually the processor is uh, comprised of the IO pins and uh, stuff like crystals and the supply, uh, voltage supply block over here. So these are the 3.3 volt supply pins that are all over the processor, the negative supply pins. And here are the VBAT, so for the battery connection, VDDA, this is the analog supply, which is, as you can see, uh, from the VDD, which is the 3.3 volt supply for the whole processor, that is passed through an LC network, so it's a low pass filter, so filter any uh, interference and other garbage for VDDA, and same for the VREF. So the reference voltage is, as you can see, for the DC voltage is basically a choke is uh, uh, short, so we have basically 3.3 volt entering the VREF, so we know which is the maximum point because we have to know it later from converting. Regarding the PA0, uh, let's say we want to use the PA0 over here. We have to know if this pin is connected to anything. So let's search for PA0. We have three here and over here. We can see this pin is also connected to a push button on this board. Let's see, this push button is connected through this resistor. And if this push button is not switched, it's open contact. And it's going through a 220 ohm kilo ohm resistor to ground, which can be a problem. 
if you have any signal coming on this pin over here, it's gonna get terminated by roughly 220 kilo ohms to ground, which should, usually isn't a problem. But for my case, I purposely had a voltage divider over here. So we have a pin to the VDD uh, and another one to the ground. And then this resistor is parallel to another voltage divider resistor, which can create a non-linear response. So you have to really be careful of choosing your pin. So let's choose another one, maybe PA1. And as you can see, the PA1 doesn't go anywhere else. So the PA1 is really suitable for choosing for this particular function. So let's remember that. So for our case, let's choose the PA1. Now let's go to the settings of the ADC. Let's go into analog section into the ADC1. As you can see, the input one has been selected. Now let's wind in this part and let's have a look at all the settings that are available to us. The first one is the mode, which is in this case forced to be independent mode as for the settings. Next is the clock prescaler, which is that prescaler we talked about of the frequency coming into the ADC. We can leave this as 2. As you can see, here's the resolution. It's automatically selected as 12 bits, which is fine. We want to have as large a resolution as possible. We're not so concerned with the number of clock cycles this uh, uh, resolution consumes because we have really slow conversions. The data alignment is right aligned, which is right. <laughs> and the scan conversion mode and the continuous conversion mode are the ones that we looked at before. So if we were to have multiple pins, let's say another one like PA2, going into the input 2. Then we need to enable scan conversion mode if you want to ADC to automatically iterate between these two. So we can enable the scan conversion mode. Now we need to increase the number of conversion in the regular channel conversion mode. In this case, two. When we do that and click enter, this is gonna create two ranks. So rank is basically a position in the order of ADC conversions, so in which order the ADC will convert different channels. And you can see there's an asterisk because we have to take a look at it. By default, these are all going to be the first channel that it is. So we have to change this one to the channel 2. So in this case, it's firstly going to convert channel 1. And then the next time we call the ADC conversion, it's going to go to the channel 2. And again, channel 1 and channel 2. If you don't want to do that automatically and want to have the control on which channel we convert, we just disable the scan conversion mode and lower this number of conversion to 1. Also, another parameter here is sampling time. This is the time that the ADC uses for converting your data. Now, this is very uh, important because the input capacitor that we looked before in the sampling time, if we change the voltage on the input very rapidly, this voltage and capacitor can increase relatively slowly because it acts like a filter. So, and it can also, if it, the change is quite fast, a lot of current can draw through the capacitor and it can low, uh, load the input of your device. So that actually the input impedance of the ADC can lower quite a bit and you have a small tiny sensor that cannot give much current, then you shouldn't have large swings in voltage. For that, we can increase the cycle, so longer period of the time the signal is going into the sample and hold circuit, so the input has a time to stabilize beyond its transition. So I do advise, and it's a bit of a, a rule of thumb, to increase the cycle as much as you can uh, as long as you need a fast conversion time. If you really need to have fast conversions, then just lower this number. So let's go for 480 in this case, it might change depending on the processor you have, but as large as you can without affecting your performance that you need. So let's just, for first, let's create these two. And let's create this one for the 480 as well. And let's disable the scan conversion mode, but before we have to uh, lower the number of conversions to one. By doing that, we can disable the scan conversion mode and just have the channel one by default. So when we have to change the channels, I'm gonna show you how to change that. So everything over here can be left to default and uh, this is really good for us for right now, but we can see that both pins have been defined for the ADC input. In the previous video, we looked at the roles of different pins and you can see by setting them for the analog input, the, the GPIO mode has been automatically selected as analog mode. So we don't have to do that ourselves.
If you want to, you can use user label so you can find your pin later in the code. So for now, let's just save this code and go to actual example. So the first example we're going to do is just read a static voltage on the ADC pin 1. For this example, I have one of those uh, Chinese uh, soil moisture capacitor sensor. I just had them lying around and it should return value from 1 volt to 2.5 volt, something like that. Uh, now it's on the surface and it's not wet. So let's measure its voltage. Now, all the initialization is already complete. This is not that uh, standard peripheral library. Everything is done over here. So all the settings are applied over here. All the pin settings are applied over here and the ADC is configured and initialized. So we just have to start the ADC manually. We have to ask it for a conversion and we wait until the conversion is complete. And then we have to get the value from the ADC data register. So let's go into the while loop because we want to do this all the time and let's create a few functions uh, or rather for the beginning let's just call them so for searching adc related functions let's go hal adc control space and find everything that is for our case let's call start so this is gonna start the adc peripheral we just have to input the handler of the uh, the pointer to the handler of the ADC. This one holds all the data for this ADC. So now we start the ADC, but in case that there is ever a problem in your configuration or in the ADC, all these functions return a status hall type def, which can be OK, error, busy or time out. So this is really handy for detecting different types of problems. So let's create a variable, let's say over here before the while loop, called ret, like return. So let's get return value right into from the hal ADC start. So let's create an if statement. If red is different from hal OK. If you want to actually detect which kind of problem was, was it a timeout or error, then you can create a little more elaborate functions. But for our case, we just want to know if the function completed successfully. And let's just call it error handler, which is a function at the bottom of the main over here that you can use for anything. So you can uh, do your own implementation, what you want to do when the function enters. But for my testing and purposes, I always just call this function. So I just know if the if function goes inside of here. Next time, as I said, we have to uh, ask the ADC, like the donkey in the Shrek 2, are we there yet? So is the conversion, uh, conversion completed? For that, we use how ADC poll from conversion. This is because we have to manually ask the ADC is their conversion completed. So the first uh, uh, so the first parameter is the ADC handler and the second one is timeout and let's just give it 20 milliseconds which is a lot but let's say just for the testing purposes enough. And it also returns a HAL status tie def and let's just copy this over here. So again we have to check if everything is okay. Now, either everything is OK or not, we're just going to take the value from the data register. We just have to, for now, interpret the data if it's correct or not, uh, depending on if the functions have been completed successfully. So let's go for how ADC get value and just the hail ADC one. And this is basically just return the value, as we can see, a 32 bit inside the integer, but we know that the data register is basically just 16 bits wide. So we can initialize a new variable, which is 16 bit high, call ADC val. Let's call it like that. So we return the ADC val, so the value of the data register into the ADC val. Also, you can see, control click, by the way, that this uh, function is very simple. It just basically reads from the instance of the data register. And that's all. In here we get the digital representation of voltage. Now let's convert it to volts so we can uh, more uh, compare it with what I can measure with my multimeter. So in order to do that we have to quantitize it or reverse quantitize it. So when we talked about quantization we talked about how the voltage gets converted to this digital value. And it goes with a simple formula that is on the screen right now. Basically the voltage is going into the EDC is equal to the digital representation of voltage 
that is multiplied by the voltage step. So the reference voltage divided by the resolution of the DAC. So if the resolution in this case is 12 bit, which is 4096 discrete steps with a maximum step of 4095. So the 3.3 volts divided by 4095 gives us a single step. So by each digital increment, the voltage gets incremented by that small step. So this is one way we can get the voltage that is actually applied to the pin. So let's create another floating variable, let's say float voltage, and let's get in this value. So it's ADC val multiplied by this, let's have it in parentheses so we know it's a step, a single step, so it's 3.3 volts divided by 4095. So this should give us a voltage in decimal form, and that's basically all. Let's pull just a small hull delay oh come on and let's put in just uh, 100 milliseconds so it won't just go crazy on us and let's put a breakpoint over here so we can just quickly jump through this point in time so let's firstly compile control b to see if we have any errors we only have one warning voltage is set but not used so this is okay just a warning and now we need to upload it to our code for your case, you probably have your stock ST flash utility and your ST link. So you're gonna use this this part over here, and you're gonna add it, and you can leave everything stock. It's everything is con, uh, set up as complete. But in my case, I have a JLink debugger on here, so I have to use this one. But it's all the same for you. So you're gonna click debug, and it's gonna compile again, upload the code, and start at the main. So let's click F8 or start resume and it's gonna go to this point in breakpoint let's use f6 to increment line by line i click the f6 and you can see the return has returned hull okay so this idc was started successfully so this function won't be executed inside the if statement again let's poll for the conversion and the hull status type def hasn't been changed so the poll was successful now let's get the adc value in this case, 1341, which is a random number because I don't have my uh, ADC attached to the proper signal. Now I have connected my soil moisture sensor onto it, and the next time we go through it, we get the proper voltage. And now let's see the, our voltage conversion. And it's 1.0806. So this was the voltage that was just on the IO pin. This is because nothing is connected to the pin except for the ADC, which has a very, very high input impedance, many mega ohms and larger. And the stray capacitance and like static charges just built on that pin. So it's important to terminate your pins if you're not using them. But now I have connected it to a proper voltage source. So when we go back, we should get the proper value. So let's go back, start the ADC, no problem, pull for the conversion, no problem, and get the value, which in this case much more appropriate. And we get the voltage is 3.258 volts. So this is the maximum voltage that is uh, currently on this pin. So uh, to automate this a little bit and create it in a, a bit of a useful function, let's create another function. This is going to do exactly that for us in here so your code doesn't get overwritten when you change the settings over here so let's create a function that returns a zero if everything was okay just like the uh, hull status type def functions and anything else if there's an error and we're gonna practice a little bit of pointers by returning the adc measured value into the uh, value of the adc by including a pointer so let's call an 8-bit return Let's call it ADSU get data. And for input, it's going to be a 16 bit uh, register of a data because it's only 12 bit maximum. And let's call it data like that. Important to add the asterisk because it will be a pointer. So, this is a simple way to get uh, data around on the processor. And the first thing, let's just copy everything we had over here. Let's just copy it over here. And remove the delay and remove the voltage because we're gonna do that by ourselves or you can create another function it's quite important to me 
and uh, the stuff that work that the functions are very one purpose so one function does a simple task so you can debug easily so what we want to do is define again the hal status type def for the return because we're gonna use that over here and then we're gonna do exactly the same now in this case we can call an error handler or we can just return the value of the error in this case if others doesn't start let's just return one and I'm used to returning zero if everything's okay, because you can have many different numbers, positive integers in this case, that can represent an error. So one can represent the ADC start failure, and let's have here return two that represents the poor conversion failure, so probably a timeout or anything else. You can also return the hull okay if you want to. So you have to have the return of hal status type def something like that, and if everything is okay, the function will come to this point, and in the end it's gonna return zero. So everything is fine. The function exited fine, and in this case we're gonna get the converted value into wherever the pointer to the data points. So asterisk and data. So this is gonna load the data of the ADC data register into data. So this function has a really, really small and simple uh, function and that's the root of coding. And we can also do another function, which can be void in this type, called adc to volt. And this will convert the input variable called, again, data, to float type called voltage. And it's going to be also a pointer. And let's create a function that basically does what we did over here let's just copy this over here so basically voltage with an asterisk is adc is data in this case so with asterisk we say that this is accessing the data where this data is pointing to and this is all okay so it's a void so basically there's nothing to fail over here really so we don't need to return anything so with this uh, simple code, we can just do something like this ADC uh, get data, and we just point, uh, give it the pointer to the ADC value. This is this end symbol over here, and it returns the status. So we can also define another 8 bit variable called return again. And if this return fails, if return is different than zero, we can go to error handler. If you want to check for which error it happens, you can check for uh, error one or two or something like that. Or if you use this function to return the status hull type def, so if you had here just return, oops, ret, and this function was a type of hull status type def, it will actually return this uh, error that this function gave out. But for our case, this is a simple testing, I don't usually go so deep for testing. So this is all that we need to do. And now if this was successful, um, then we can convert it to voltage in either case. So let's call ADC to volt and give it ADC val and ADC voltage is just automatically found them. This is lovely. And let's give it a hull delay of let's say 100 milliseconds. It, we're, already gonna debug okay let's create a breakpoint over there and compile again to see if we have any errors no that's great so let's go and re-upload so this button is quite useful because it recompiles re-upload and starts the function so you don't have to terminate it and then again upload it let's go remove this one and let's go f8 to this one and let's see the value has been written to our register which is fine the return was zero, so it was complete successfully, and to voltage, it's 3.27 volts. So it works amazingly. Another upgrade that I want to talk to you before I let you go to do your own experimentation is maybe change the pins. We have defined two pins, so the pin 1 and pin 2, and how can you create to change those pins? Well, the answer is in the adc.c file, and here's the configurations for the regular cha uh, channel pin. So we have to configure the channel, rank, and sampling time. 
and had to call this function and inside this if function basically if this function fails then it goes to error handler so this is a longer version of what we did before i don't really like this type of writing because you can never see what is going on so uh, but this is uh, good enough i guess so we have to copy this and implement it in our adc uh, function so before we do anything we have to configure the channel that the adc will be reading now the rank and sampling time can be left to these default values but the channel has to be some kind of value that has been passed into the function so we've passed an argument to the function to know which channel to read so what is the name of this channel so well when we control click on it we go to the header file and you can see basically the adc channel one are just macros for 32 bit uh, definitions and that's all we need to know so basically the argument is gonna be a 32 bit argument called it's called channel and this channel we go instead of this one over here so we insert the name of the channel over here the pointer to our data and it gets changed over here next thing also we have to define this as config on the beginning so we don't uh, so we have something to write into so we can do another return over here my uh, free let's say so if it failed somehow configuring the adc channel it can exit out before doing anything uh, uh, anything over here so if it fails there's no point going forward so then we just have to include another argument in our function over here so argument should be adc channel control space and in this case channel 1 is the one that has my sensor let's control b compile again and re-upload and restart our function when it completes let's go to the beginning and again return is zero the value is 4072 and the voltage is 3.28 volt so everything works so this is one type of uh, implementation of uh, getting data from the adc and each time you can change the pin you can have multiple channels in an array and you can just cycle in a for loop through the array and fill another array that has the data and another array that has voltages and stuff like that another maybe tip for uh, converting to voltage i don't usually like to use floating points that much because i would uh, like to send the number through uart or some kind of a serial interface that only uses characters and uh, taking a float and dividing into a whole number and a decimal point is really a pain so I usually like to transform all the voltages into millivolts so I would like to uh, multiply it by a thousand or create a 3300 millivolt upper range which is the same as 3.3 volts and now our uh, voltage data is again a 16-bit integer like that and then you can have to change everything else over here and your voltage will be now expressed in 16 bit uh, whole data so it will be in millivolts which is really handy for converting it over uart and other interfaces or multi or uh, manipulating it with later again but for these purposes i show it in volts because it's much more intuitive to watch it like that so this was really simple i didn't do any uh, dma i also have a video on that from the standard peripheral library which is uh, usually should be very importable but uh, this is for today it's really long one and uh, i really want you to experiment on yourself but if i have another simple functionality that we have to implement in adc i'll do it in a later video i am already uh, experimenting with two different adc one is external for spi configuration and the next one is from i square c so we're gonna look at how we can use external adcs with the knowledge we get from the serial uh, interfaces like spi and i square c so when we do this introduction videos the, then we're gonna do some project videos until then thanks for watching and if you have any questions please comment down below and if i get anything wrong also comment and i'll see you next time thank you